Okay. Today, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about um, why we're interested in case law. A, a little bit about the overview, an overview of the court structure in Ontario, how to find case law, how to note it up, and how to cite it. So that's basically what I'm going to cover. Jeanette this morning talked to you about statute law. Statute law is, is one of the major sources of law in Canada, in Ontario. The other major source of law in Ontario is case law. And when we say case law, what we're talking about are the reasons for judgment that a judge writes in an individual civil or criminal matter before the court. The judge looks at the facts of the case and he relates the facts or she relates the facts to legal principles and comes up with a decision. And those are known as the reasons for judgment of the case. Now, if the facts of every trial are different, why should we be interested in case law if every, if every trial uh, is tried on different facts? Well, the reason we're interested in case law is because Ontario is what is known as a common law province. The term common law has several different meanings, but in this context, I'm using it to mean the body of case law that's decided in our courts. Professor Gall, he's one of the authors in the reference, uh, I think the reference sources bibliography we handed out, it's a three-page um, handout. He, um, um, he explains that the reliance on the common law in a search for precedence in order to resolve new cases is a principal feature of the common law system of law. The common law approach is to scrutinize the judgments of previous cases and to extract general principles to be applied to particular problems at hand. Owing to the doctrine known as stare decisis, which is a Latin term meaning to stand by decided decisions, by decided matters, judges in a common law system are bound to follow precedent cases decided by judges of higher courts, given a similar fact situation in the precedent case and the case at hand. Now, Professor Gall said that um, judges are bound to follow decisions of higher courts. They're not bound to fo follow decisions of lower courts. The Court of Appeal of Ontario doesn't have to be concerned about what the small claims court said, but it does have to be concerned about what the Supreme Court of Canada has said on a matter. Therefore, when you're researching case law, even though it's case law, you have to know a little bit about the court structure in the jurisdiction you're working with. You have to know that a case from a higher court is going to be given more weight than a case from a lower court. <coughs> And you also have to know for absolute certain that this is the final disposition of the case. Um, you have to know generally that um, cases can be appealed. Generally, and I'm quoting someone here, generally any party to a suit in a trial court who isn't satisfied with the decision of the court has the right to appeal the case to a higher court. If the case originated in a very <coughs> inferior court, and involved an important principle of law, it might be possible for several successive appeals to be taken. The highest court to which an appeal can be taken on any particular point is sometimes called a court of last resort. So when you find that case that supports the client's position, you have to be sure that you note it up to make sure that it's good law, that it hasn't been reversed or modified. If you don't, opposing counsel will have, and your uh, lawyer could be embarrassed in court. So I think um, I just want to take you quickly through an overview of the court structure in Ontario. That works. Um, you have it in your package. It's on page 2-1. It might be easier to follow on that. This isn't very large. Um, court structure in Ontario consists of a couple of levels. At the moment, it's a little confusing. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but just this past April, the Ontario government changed some of the names of the courts. Um, I could not find a ready-made diagram of the courts, so I've made this one up. As, you go through, as we go through it, you'll notice that I've, I've included the former names of the courts before April. 
this isn't a nice, this isn't just a nice little piece of historical information. You may have to know this because the Ontario government has just made an announcement that even though the changes to the court names were effective April 19th, the Ontario government has announced that it won't be putting up any new signs as a result of the court changes. So bear in mind when you're filing papers for the Superior Court of Justice that the sign of the building is still going to show the own old name, the Ontario Court General Division. That's why you have to know this. Um, according to this government release, which is in your package, I think it's 2-2, two, two, um, Changes to external signage on court buildings will occur only through ongoing replacement and repair. Any costs associated with implementation of the name changes within the courts are being kept to an absolute minimum. So by the time ongoing uh, repairs dictate that a new sign can go up, the court names will probably have changed anyway. Uh, You'll also be happy to know that this release says that you can use these printed forms with the old court names and court seals up until the end of the day on April 18th, year 2000. So you don't have to throw out your stock of forms yet. Okay, if we look at the chart, at the bottom right, we have the Ontario Court of Justice, formerly called the Ontario Court Provincial Division. This is a court that is administered by the province with provincially <coughs> appointed judges. This court deals with all but the most serious criminal offenses as well as Young Offenders Act cases and in areas where the jurisdiction of the family court has not yet been proclaimed, it deals also with child protection, adoption, custody, access and support. To the left of it, we have the Superior Court of Justice, which was formerly, up till April, called the Ontario Court General Division. It's a court also administered by the province, but with federally appointed judges. And it has three separate branches, which have been around for a while. The Divisional Court, the Family Court, and the Small Claims Court. This court deals with matters such as judicial review, appeals, the most serious criminal offenses, summary conviction appeals, civil cases, divorces, division of property, and other family law matters, and small claims. Um, it has been described as the court with unlimited jurisdiction and unlimited power to administer the law except insofar as a statute specifically gives exclusive jurisdiction to, an, uh, to another court or tribunal. If you take these two branches, uh, sorry, these are called divisions. If you take these two divisions, the Superior Court of Justice and the Ontario Court of Justice together, they're known as the Court of Ontario. And you can think of them as the tri Ontario's trial courts. Now, I mentioned that the Superior Court of Justice has a branch called the Family Court. Um, the Family Court, I've always found rather confusing, so I'll say a word about it. It is a branch of the Superior Court, but family law, according to the Constitution Act, comes under both federal and provincial jurisdiction. For instance, the Divorce Act is federal, but the Family Law Act, the Family Support Plan Act, and the Children's Law Reform Act are all provincial. So in areas of Ontario that don't have a family court, which started its life being called the Unified Family Court, family law cases can be heard in both the Ontario Court of Justice, which is a court administered by the province with federally appointed judges, and in the Superior Court of Justice, which is a court administered by the province with federally appointed, judge, federally appointed judges. And in practical terms, the parties could, might have to travel across the city to have their matter attended to if the courts were in different buildings. And this is because, according to the Constitution, provincial judges don't have jurisdiction in divorce and division of property. Because of this, a few years, some years ago, actually, I think it was in the 70s or maybe the 80s, the Ontario and the and federal uh, governments got together and decided that they would have a, an experiment where they have one court called the Unified Family uh, Court, which would hear all matters related to family law. It started out as a, as a pilot project in Hamilton. It's been very successful and it's going to be extended again in September and eventually the Ontario government hopes that it will be uniform across uh, Ontario. But it isn't called the Uniform Family Court anymore, it's called the Family Court. 
Are you, have I confused you all? Is that clear? Okay. Okay, to, back to the chart. At the top of the pyramid, we have the Court of Appeal for Ontario. This court fortunately didn't change its name. It's always been called the Court of Appeal, I think. And it's an appellate court, the highest court in Ontario. From here, appeals can only be taken to the Supreme Court of Canada and only if leave to appeal has been granted. What I haven't put on the chart are all the administrative board um, and tribunals that function across the province. Administrative boards or, tr or tribunals are, are said to perform quasi-judicial functions and they usually, well they always um, hear uh, cases in a particular area where they're given power by a statute such as uh, rent review or labor or workers' compensation. Until QL, does everyone know what QL is? Yes, you must. Until QL came on the scene, it was virtually impossible to find these judgments. They actually seem to take some sort of perverse delight in hiding them away. But QL has managed to get quite a few of these judgments and put them on their databases. So they're a little bit easier to find now. And I think that when the tribunals first started working, they didn't want their decisions out there. They didn't want to be bound by precedent. They wanted to be able to make decisions quickly, just based on the facts. And that's why they weren't too anxious to give us their decisions. A good place to find out about Ontario or federal tribunals is on the Ontario government or the federal government website. Um, occasionally, only very rarely, yeah, I'm sorry, that is um, listed on one of these handouts, 2-9. Those are the Ontario government and the federal government websites. Uh, if nothing else, you'll find out a little information about the board there. And sometimes, occasionally, they will actually publish their decisions or orders on the web. We, we put in two examples, the CRTC and the Ontario Energy Board uh, actually have their decisions on the web. Now, one last thing about the courts. Um, along with these changes to the uh, names of the courts that were effective in April um, came changes to the way we address judges. There used to be a distinction in the um, Ontario courts as to who was a justice and who was a judge. Justice is considered the more distinctive term and it is how judges like to be addressed. So now all judges in the Court of Ontario can be addressed as justice, rather you shouldn't address them, address them as judge anymore. And um, your handout uh, numbered page 22 from the Ministry of the Attorney General goes into that a little more, in a little more detail. Um, you can say justice, you can say Madam Justice, you can still say your honor, but you shouldn't say judge. Okay. Christian? Yes. Oh, the circuit the court. State's yeah. It, it would be nice to see it um, sort of with a dash in front of it and under the uh, okay. Court of Justice. All right, we'll make a note of that. Can you repeat that, please? Can you repeat that? Oh, it would be nice to see the state's court, uh, the old circuit court office, because that's, that's where it is located in the uh, now Superior Court of Justice. Yeah. I actually um, contacted the Ministry of the Attorney General because I wanted to show you a chart and um, asked them if they had one. And they were very nice and very helpful, but they said they didn't have a chart. But if I was going to make it up, would I please share it with them? Because <laughs> they get asked for it a lot. So I'll add that and share it with the Ministry. Yes? You have to have on the in the title of proceeding, you have um, Centre in Italics, Ontario, and then right below it Superior Court of Justice. Well that's interesting because I lacking any documentation from, from anyone on this, I basically read the Courts of Justice Act, which um, is what breaks down the, the courts and 
that's interesting because it, that doesn't give you any indication of, of that. Yeah, so. Well, now there's a very good example. Whose authority do you take here? Do you take the Courts of Justice Act itself, or do you take the authority of the registrar? Uh, I, uh, hmm. That's very interesting. Oh dear. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the best networking. Yeah. So yeah. It's you're aware of yes, I think it's going to take some time to get this sorted out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all I can say is that it, 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 there is no indication of that in the act, so it's something to. But it's it's interesting to hear. Okay. Well. Um, so we've got all these trial courts, and we've got all these appeal courts. We're not quite sure of their names, but we know they're there. And it's important that these judgments are accessible to us. This is where law reporting comes in. Law reporting probably began as a way for the parties in the case to preserve a record of what was decided regarding their life, liberty, or property. But now, it serves a very important role of facilitating legal research. And allow, if the cases weren't reported, we wouldn't be able to find them, and the courts wouldn't be able to use them as precedents. In England, law reporting began in 1283. In Ontario, the first law report began in, uh, was in 1823. So there are lots and lots of precedents around. Those of you who went to the library tour, um, I will say that if we brought down all the all of the law reports that we have in paper in the library, we couldn't begin to get them in this room. We couldn't get a third of them in this room. And then we've got dozens and dozens, scores and scores of CD-ROMs and reels and reels of microfilm and unimaginable <coughs> amounts of case law on QL, uh, eCarswell, LexisNexis. So there is no scarcity of precedents for you to look for. Canadian law reports themselves, and I'm talking about the, really the paper ones now, are organized into series specializing in federal, national, regional, provincial, or topical case law. If you want to follow along, it is handout 2-4. Uh, Now, all law reports are classified as official, semi-official, and unofficial. And again, this isn't a nicety. You're supposed to know this when you cite reports because you cite the official one first. Um, official reports are those published under the authority of the court. Semi-official ones are usually published under the authority of a regulatory body like the Law Society. Thank you. And unofficial ones are those published by commercial um, publishers. Um, the first category on your list are the federal uh, reports. The Supreme Court of Can the Canada Supreme Court Re Supreme Court reports cited SCR only report Supreme Court of Canada reports. So what we know from this is that when we cite the Supreme Court of Canada reports, the SCRs. We don't have to tell our reader where the case is from. That's implicit in the site SCR. They're supposed to know that. You wouldn't repeat it. The Canada Federal Court reports report both the trial and the appeal level of the federal court. So when we cite these reports, we have to tell our readers which level it is. These two reports, the Supreme Court reports and the Federal Court reports, are the official really the only official law reports in, in Canada. The next one down, National Reporter, is a publication of the Maritime Law Book. And it really started because it took so long for the reports to get into the Supreme Court reports that we needed something that was faster. It reports Supreme Court, uh, reports, Supreme Court cases and both levels of the federal court. The federal trial reports only report the federal trial reports. The 
national or regional category of reports are broad um, categories that uh, report in several jurisdictions. The DLRs are really a national reporter. They report any level, any court, on any subject. The WWRs only report from the western provinces or territories. So you know that when you see these ones cited, the DLRs or the WWRs, you have to tell your reader what the court is and what the level is. And we'll get into how you do that later when we come to the citing. But the reason why you have to know something about the law reports is you have to know what's in them so you can provide additional information to your reader. If you look at the provincial law reports, you can see that every province has at least one, if not two, law reports dedicated to cases from that jurisdiction. When you look at the citations that we've listed here beside the law report, you can see that the reader will know the jurisdiction, but the reader won't know the level of the court. So this information we have to add. Then we come to the last group here, and it's the biggest group. Even though it's, it's not the biggest group here, we've only given you the tip of the iceberg. I wouldn't be surprised if there were over 100 subject reports now in Canada. It's the category of law reports that have experienced the greatest expansion in recent years. Um, new areas of law have spanned new case reporters, NAFTA, Free Trade, the Charter, they've all spawned new uh, case reporters by subject. The publisher brings them out in the hopes that he can find a market. And if he doesn't, then the reports are discontinued fairly quickly. But of course, they would still be on the shelf in the library. Subject reports are usually national in scope, and they include both dis uh, decisions from specialized tribunals as well as courts. And there is a high level of duplication between what's in these reports. The DLRs can pick up a Supreme Court report. The family law reports will pick up a decision from Alberta. It's not uncommon to have the same case published in three, four, even five law reporters. Most of the law reports we've mentioned, um, the national, the subject, they all are organized along the same lines. They all begin with a table of cases to the volume. Um, the they all um, have lists of authorities published in the volumes, cases cited, statute cited, even sometimes textbook cited. Then each individual case reported in the volume begins with the style of cause, and I presume you all know the style of cause is the name of the case, like Smith versus Jones or whatever. The date, the court level, the judge, the counsel, list of cited authorities in that case, and then a summary called a head note or a caption. Most of the reporters publish the decisions in, in full, but not all of them. Some of them only summarize it. And you should be aware that it can take up to six months or more for a case to find its way into the law reports. It's still good law, even before it gets into the law reports. And only a small percentage of cases ever end up in the law reports. Those that don't are labeled unreported. So those are the kinds, the categories of law reports we have in Canada. And it's not a difficult matter if you have a citation to one of these reporters to go to a library or go online and find it. But what if you don't have any case what reference to start your research? How do you find a case on the subject? Well, lawyers may tell you they do this, but I don't think very many lawyers go to the law reports first to look for a subject. They usually put the step off and they go to a leading textbook, they go to a service, they even go to a journal article to identify the issues and to get a grounding and analysis in the subject area. If an author of a text has become a leading authority in a field of law, you want to see what he or she is citing. Um, but that, of course, isn't enough. After you've looked over the textbooks or the article, and perhaps there isn't a uh, textbook or an article, then you have to make a search of the case law. You don't have to search each law report individually. There are services that you can use to find case law. The first, um, there are actually indexes to, to most law report series, but it isn't a very efficient way to search. 
unless you're searching one of the topical reports that we looked at, the reports of family law or the business law reports. When you do that, you've already chosen a reporter that's focused on your area of law. And these indexes are cumulative, the ones that are issued with the, the subject reporters. They're not just to one volume, they're, they're usually to a whole series. So you get, when you use those reporters, you get a classified breakdown of the topics in the series. You get a list of the issues and you get brief digest. And just by scanning the index and seeing the way the editors have broken the topics down, you're discovering possibilities for other points of law, related points of law, which you may not have known about. So they can be useful. There are also a number of digests and encyclopedias you can look at to find case law. But again, once you find the case law in the digest, that's not enough. You have to use the digest as a step to get to the full text of the report in the law reports. You don't want your lawyer, the lawyer doesn't want to base an opinion for a client on just a small digest. Um, one of the finding tools for case law in Ontario are the encyclopedias. And actually, we only have one in Ontario. It's called the Canadian Encyclopedic Digest, in brackets, in parentheses, Ontario Second Edition. And everyone refers to it as CED, capital C-E-D. Sorry. It's about 35 volumes in print, and it's loose leaf. The benefit of CED is that it's written like a textbook. It's written, it gives you a brief overview of the law in the area, and it footnotes the cases at the bottom of the page. There is a volume that the publisher calls the Key and Research Guide, and this contains a list of subject titles for the whole set. If you look there, it will tell you what volume, in what volume your subject title is going to be found. You browse through the list to determine which broad topic, such as torts or estates, is relevant to your topic. Then you go to the white pages of the volume indicated, and at the beginning of the topic, you'll find a contents or a classified list of the breakdown of the subject. From there, you determine where your topic fits in. There is also an index to the set, but I, I think the classified approach is a little easier. Uh, when you've read your, your, your law in the white pages of the CEDs, you always have to go to the yellow pages of the CEDs, which contain the update. If you don't go to the updates, you could miss some new development, some new point of law that's arisen in, uh, recently. If you go to your handout on, I think it's 2.7, Canadian case law finding tools. The, f the first finding tool we've got listed there is the Canadian abridgment. The Canadian abridgment is the staple, it's the mainstay, it's the flagship of Canadian legal research. It claims to be comprehensive. It claims to, re to digest every case ever reported in Canada, as well as some unreported ones. Um, I have no indication that that's not true, so I will accept that. It has a table of cases, so that if you have a case cited, you can use the table of cases to quickly find out where that case is in the digest, and then you'll find other cases that are similarly on point. The abridgment in its paper form is at least 50 volumes long. It's published by Carswell as CED is, so you'll find a lot of similarities between CED and the abridgment, particularly in their indexes and research key. The abridgment, like CED, is arranged under broad topic, like estates or railways. But the difference is there isn't any text connecting the digest. There's no overview of legal principles. There's just pages and pages of digest and digest. It has an index, and it has a key and research guide, just like CED. It has the classification breakdown. And remember that the abridgment is supposed to be comprehensive. So unlike the CED, you're not just getting the leading cases, you're getting all of the cases. Uh, and, you ha and someone has to make a determination which cases are the leading cases. Once you've found your digest there, your next step is to update it. 
the abridgment is not loose leaf, it's in a hard cover. So you update the abridgment through two supplementary <coughs> volumes. One of these is called the Canadian Abridgment Supplement, and the other one is called the CCL Case Digest. Usually, uh, there shall be beside the main volumes of an, uh, the abridgment in any library, and at any given time, you might have to go through three or four of these pamphlets to update your digest. On the list, we've also, um, are there any questions about the abridgment? Any questions at all? No? Okay. We've also listed some other digest under um, digest, the All Canada Weekly Summaries, the Lawyers <coughs> Weeklies, the Law Times. These aren't comprehensive digests like the abridgment. Their coverage doesn't go back very far, and they're really digests that are valued for their currency. Because it can take up to six months or sometimes more for a case to get into the law reports, the printed law reports, you can't rely on those to have the most recent cases. These digests are quite um, rapid in getting cases and, and digests in there, so they are used for current awareness. Another useful feature of these digests, the, AC, the All Canada Weekly Summaries, which is always abbreviated ACWS, or the Lawyers Weekly, or the Law Times, or any, any of these digests, and there are a lot of subject digests, like um, Weekly Digests of Family Law, uh, Weekly Digests of Civil Procedure. They usually have a full text photocopy service, so that if you can't find the case reported, or if you can't find it on QL, you can call up the publisher and buy a copy of the reasons for judgments. Okay, well, so far, we've been focusing on print sources. It probably won't surprise you to hear that in the last five years, just about every one of these law reports and digest I've mentioned has become available on CD-ROM in addition to paper. The problem that we have in, in the library with CD-ROMs is not their functionality, but the fact that the publisher doesn't sell them to you he leases them to you. So if you cancel the subscription, you're left with nothing. Unlike the paper series, where if you cancel it, at least you have those volumes that have come in uh, under your subscription. From a functional point of view, CD-ROMs are wonderful. Um, they have excellent searching capabilities. They have vast storage potential. Most Canadian CD-ROMs that we have run on a software called Folio Views, or Folio. And Folio, view, Folio, I think, pioneered the use of templates, which are the little interactive boxes that you type your question into. And they um, customize those templates according to what they've got on the CD-ROM. So if you're searching the statute database, it's different from the box that you use to search a, a case law database. You can usually limit your search by date, by jurisdiction, by court, by other things. And one, usually CD-ROMs in libraries are available for free. You, you, they're available on the library network or the library's computers, and you don't have to pay for them. They're very easy to use. Uh, generally, it doesn't take us more than five minutes to show people the basics of using a CD-ROM. They have, oh, yes? How are they? I mean, what is the... Um, some of them, a lot of them are updated quarterly. A number of them, you can update them on the publisher's website. You can, um, when you subscribe to it, you automatically get to, to use the publisher's website to go in and update it. Uh, sometimes you have to pay for that, sometimes it's part of the subscription. They're pretty current. Um, particularly the statute ones, the publishers are, know how important it is and they update them. I don't know about the Ontario government statute CD-ROM, we don't get that, but um, the Ca Canada Law Book statutes, uh, statute citator is very current. The abridgment is updated four times a year, so you're missing cases for several months and you have to use the digest. With the CDs, um, what I think got people interested in them in the beginning is that you can 
open them up like a book. You can browse them and open them up in layers. You can look at the table of contents, you can look at the index, you can look at them case by case. So they're very familiar um, technology. It isn't um, all that different from using a book, except that it's much faster when you're looking for something. But CD, um, even though we like it, it's often called an interim technology. People expect that it's going to give way to online vendors, particularly to web or internet-based product services. And certainly we've seen that most Canadian publishers are scrambling to get a presence on the internet, to get their material onto proprietary websites. Has, ever, has anyone here, everyone, who has used QL? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so most of you have, at least half of you have. For those of you who haven't, um, Quick Law or QL, it's the most comprehensive, the oldest, and the most used legal online service in Canada. It began as a text based dial in service in 1973. Today, it has access to just a vast range of law reports themselves as well as unreported cases, as well as administrative board decisions. It downloads the text of unreported decisions very quickly. The Supreme Court reports are up there within hours of them being handed down. It also has some law reports on there as law reports. Some of the databases are actually the law reports, so that you can search rather than searching just unreported cases, you can confine your search to one law report. But unfortunately, the latest development with QL has seen Carswell, who, was an, uh, who is a legal publisher and a major contributor to QL's databases, pulling out. As someone mentioned earlier, Carswell now has its own web-based service called eCarswell. So it's competing directly with QuickLaw. It's taken its law reports, it's taken the Canadian abridgment and its citator off QL. I'm not sure whether it's off right now, but if it isn't, it will be off very soon. Uh, and that's because they want you to, to subscribe to eCarswell. Um, now, if you're not familiar with these, the terms, if you look on um, page 28, I have a list of online vendors. Uh, eCarswell is spelt with a small e and then Carswell. The way Carswell has gone is to put out um, different components on eCarswell. The, the component that we're most interested in for law reporting is something called LawPro, which contains the abridgment, uh, lots and lots of, of uh, all of Carswell's law reports, plus most other law reports as well, and unreported decisions. And then they have specialty areas, which specialty lawyers would be interested in. Securities Pro, Insolvency Pro, Family Pro. And then we have LexisNexis. It just goes on and on. LexisNexis has just come into Canada. Um, it's in the process of digitizing another huge amount of information. Another, uh, all, it wants to get all Canadian law reports on, and it wants to get all the unreported decisions on. and it's now offering them for a fee over the internet. The last three publishers that are on your list the, on page 2.8 there, the Canada Law Book, CCH Maritime Law Book, they also have a presence on the internet, but it's small in comparison with the, the big three. Generally what they do is they allow their subscribers to update their CD-ROMs or update their paper subscription on there or to subscribe directly to some law reports. We put the home pages of all the vendors, the major vendors, on page 28, and you can get a lot of information on the home pages. What the commercial vendors offer changes from day to day practically. Um, so when you want to know what's on there, it's a good idea to go into their home page and have a look at it. Um, now, um, there, there is a definite overlap in what these online vendors offer. They all have different bells and whistles. They all uh, use different search techniques. When you begin using the services, you should demand, ask for training, and um, don't be satisfied until they come and give you training. That's the best way to go about it. The other um, handout we've got here is on 
free internet sites. That's a little bit different. A handout uh, 2.9. This is just a selection of free internet sites where you can get case law. The Supreme Court of Canada goes back to 1989, and it's a pretty good site. There isn't a lot of case law yet on the internet. There may well be more in future. I think the catch is, though, when there is more, they may start charging for it. Um, so uh, there are also a couple of um, links at the bottom of the Virtual Canadian Law Library and Best Guide to Canadian Legal Research. They try to monitor what's on the internet in relation to case law. By tomorrow, there may be two new sites that aren't listed here. Any questions? Should I go on to the next component, noting up? Okay. <coughs> yes. So, then we say the most accessible way to access the current cases would be via electronic. Yes. I would say that that is true. You, you can get the latest cases. Uh, the latest cases are more likely to be on the electronic sources, QL, or, and I don't use eCars. Well, we don't have it yet. I've seen it demonstrated, but I expect eCars will. Um, When you say the internet, do you mean a commercial vendor like commercial a, vendor. yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's two possibilities. Either the particular cases he's looking for aren't on there, or he's not searching properly. Um, it's hard. To, it's hard to know. The digest services are very fast. The ones we've mentioned, the ACWSs, but I don't think they're as fast as um, as the internet, at least in my experience. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to go on to noting up cases, and we just have to say a few words about it. Fortunately, it's it's a vital part of your research. Um, fortunately, it's quite easy to do. We spoke earlier about the fact that cases can be appealed to a higher court and perhaps the judgment of the lower court overturned. When you're working with cases, it must be automatic that you note it up to make sure it's still good law. You don't want a lawyer relying on a case that's been overturned. Also, when you note up cases, you have the advantage of seeing whether the case has been, has been cited as an authority by other cases. And this will show you uh, where newer cases are on your point of law. It can lead you to further authorities. Um, we've listed somewhere here, we have listed the main noter uppers. Uh, it's handout 27 at the bottom, citators. Um, cases are usually noted up in services called citators. The process is fairly straightforward once you've found the case you want to note up. The Canadian abridgment appears again. Uh, it's the first one here under citators, and this is a com Canadian abridgment has several components. This one is called Canadian case citations. And when you use this, you just look the case up by style of cause, by name of the case, in the main volume, and you'll follow it through the supplementary pamphlets. The abridgment citator, it's also available on CD-ROM. We have it in the library. It's now on eCar as well. Um, QL also has a citator. It's listed there. It's called QuickCite. And Lexis, and to use, it's a very, for those of you who've used it, know it's very easy. You just click on a link button, and it tells you um, the subsequent history of the case. LexisNexis has just this month come out with a, its own site here called, I haven't used it yet, First Site. So you have many choices. 
All of these uh, services use similar terminology to tell you what's happened to your case. Um, if you look on handout 213, you can see some of the terminology that you're going to find. Obviously, the one you're looking for is reversed. If you see that, you, you don't hand that case over until you found the case that reversed it. If you see a firm, that's good, but you also want to go and get the case that affirmed it because even though it's affirmed, the judges in the higher court may have had something to say about the case. It can be varied, it can be quashed or set aside. Uh, these are just some of the terms you'll see when you note up a case. The second part of this is the treatment of the case by other cases. In other words, a, a case um, that is considered to be a leading authority will often be cited by another court with approval. They'll say, um, we, we followed this court, we adopted its, re we followed this judgment, we adopted its reasoning and we're relying on it or we didn't follow it. We considered it, we mentioned it, we didn't think it was worthy of going into in any good detail, any detail, we just mentioned it. So these are fairly common terms, they're usually abbreviated to AFF for affirmed or whatever. Um, are there any questions about noting up? It's a fairly straightforward process. You just have to be aware that you have to do it. Okay. Well, before we um, go into citation modes, um, I'd like just to say a few words about the choice of format. You can see from this overview that, excuse me, Canadian researchers don't lack for choices in researching case law. Whether you want to use paper, CD, online, depends on several factors. We also have case law and microfilm, but no one in their right mind would use microfilm, so I'm not even going to discuss that. Um, I have to confess that it's been years, really literally years since I've used the Canadian abridgment in paper. The CD product is so good that I go automatically to it. But then I don't have to read those digests. I just have to show lawyers how to find them. I don't know whether you're expected to read them or not, but I don't like to read screens and screens of digest. So that's a factor in deciding what you're going to look at. Um, but despite my own preferences here, I caution you that there's nothing magical about electronic research. It can be wonderfully fast and productive, but it's only one way to find answers. Because the computer is so good at finding facts and keywords, the tendency of beginning researchers is to use it exclusively to try to locate cases with identical facts. Facts are important, but you're unlikely to find something identical in terms of facts. Concentrate instead on finding relevant issues which hopefully the lawyer will be able to extrapolate to her client's fact situation. And remember that books are a technology too, and books are often the best way to obtain a framework for understanding an area of the law, its legal concepts, terms of arts, governing authorities, and regulatory structure. Books can be browsed and one sometimes finds things by serendipity. To get an overview of shareholders' rights, I would not recommend any online case search. However, to find the specific case in which a judge decided that they would determine the price of shares by a mechanism that was like a TV quiz show, and that was an actual case, I would go nowhere but online uh, sources. Computers can integrate facts with legal concepts nicely in the right situation. But when you search law reports, whether they're online, in paper, or on CDD, CD, the benefit you receive is that someone, presumably an editor chosen for her knowledge in the area, has selected those, those law reports. She's selected them because she's knowledgeable in the area and she's decided that they clarify conflicting decisions or they interpret a difficult point or they make new law. When you use a database, containing unreported decisions, there's been no selection process at work. There's been nothing that weighed the merits of the case as worthy precedents. 
All cases the publisher can find are thrown into the computer. The danger here, excuse me, is that if you pull out two or 102 cases on a subject, you can't tell what you failed to find. If the prevailing authority is a 1969 case and the database's coverage begins in 1979, you won't find that authority. And just in case you think only recent cases are important, I can tell you that our, our statistics show that the most heavily photocopied case in the library is a British case from 1893. When you use a free internet source, remember to ask yourself who's behind the source. What's its authority? If it's the Supreme Court of Canada, you're probably okay. But <clears throat> if it's someone you've never heard of, you better check it out as, before you cite what you found there as an authority. The best approach is to think of the various formats as complementing each other. None are complete or should stand alone, but you should use them all together, if you can, for the best research outcome. Okay. Um, any questions before you go on to citing uh, case, cases? Okay. Well, c citation form for reports causes people a lot of problems. Um, it's, it is important. It's picky, but it's important. Because if you want to communicate the results of your case research back to the inquirer, all this work you've done, if you don't cite your authorities properly or if you make mistakes, no one's going to be able to verify your work. When you hand in a piece of research, you want it to look professional. When you cite, you should be consistent, thorough, and most importantly, you must check that your citations are accurate. I cannot tell you the amount of time librarians and lawyers waste chasing down inaccurate citations. The book Jeanette showed you earlier, this one, Canadian Guide to Uniform Legal Citation. It's now into the fourth edition. It's on your list of reference sources. And it's published in 1998. It's the most, um, most uniformly used citation manual. It's not the only one, but it's the most frequently used one in Canada. Um, it's a book that seems to have thought of every possibility, at least very little to the imagination. It has a list of abbreviations in it that you use to abbreviate the law reports themselves, plus it has dictates to use for everything you might want to cite. So uh, I think if you look at handout 214, we're going to look at the basic elements of a case citation. Everybody got um, 214? Okay. This is pretty basic. Uh, I have the case here of Vachon versus Stratton. 1909, 10 WLR, 157-2 SASC-LR, 72. Below that in a box, we have the case history. Now, if you go down to the second box, Vachon and Stratton is what's known as the style of cause. When you write this, you italicize the names of the parties. The McGill Guide tells you not to italicize the V. I balk at that. <laughs> so do most law reports. Most law reports italicize the V. But this Bible of Canadian citation tells you you shouldn't do that. Um, notice that there are no first names there. You leave the first names out. You don't say Mary Vachon versus Henry Stratton. You just have the last names. Those are the names of the parties to the litigation. In criminal cases, um, criminal cases are in the name of the queen, and you use the Latin um, and abbreviate it to R for Regina. So it becomes R versus Smith or whatever. The only time you'd use the phrase, the queen, is in a private action against the state. You also never refer to a case uh, by the common uh, name, by the slang term. You'd never say the no versus no case or the Sunday shopping case. You always give the names of the parties. The next element in the um, case citation is the date of the decision. 1909 is the date the decision was handed down by the court. 10 is the volume number. 
WLR is the source abbreviation. WLR in this instance stand, stands for Western Law Reporter. 157 is the page. And two Saskatchewan Law Report second is a, an alternative or a parallel citation to the same case. In um, brackets at the end, we've had to supply not the um, jurisdiction, because we were told by the citation that it's from Saskatchewan, but we've had to say that it was the trial division, because we can't tell that from the citation. So we put that in in round brackets at the end. The other element that you might notice is in the top box, where it says reversed in part, subnom. Subnom is Latin for another name. It's another name uh, by which the case is known. <clears throat> this isn't just a reversal. Stratton is spelled differently. You normally wouldn't put in a subnom if the parties were just reversed. Now we have another, 215 has a number of a sample of sites that I want to go over with you to point out different things. Okay, the first one we've got there, has everybody got that page? We've got McGilvery versus Shaw. So let's just go through some of these. It's not Mary McGilvery versus Artie Shaw, it's just McGilvery versus Shaw. Only the last names. At the end of this site, we've added the information Alberta Court of Appeal because we can't tell that from the citation. As we said earlier, the DLRs report any court, any jurisdiction. That's why you have to know something about the law reports. You, you have to know the DLRs report more than just Alberta cases or you have to have an idea that they report across Canada. You notice that after the DLR, we have the series statement. In this case, it's the second series of DLRs, and that always goes in after the abbreviation in round brackets. Notice the date, 1963, after McGilvery versus Shaw, is in round brackets. Does everybody know the difference? Does anyone know the difference between round brackets and squared brackets? Hmm. That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, well, a round bracket is used when the date is the date of the decision. Usually in that instance, a volume number is supplied by the publisher. In this case, 39. The 1963 is not part of the volume numbering system. It's just an an added piece of information you put in for your reader, you would find this volume, this case, by going to volume 39 on the shelves. But if you go down to the next um, case, number two, Rue Milieu, 1958 Quebec Superior Court, the 1958 is in square brackets. When there isn't a volume number included as part of the reporter numbering system, and instead the publisher puts a date only on the spine, that year becomes an essential part of the citation, and then you put it in square brackets. You couldn't find this case if you didn't have the date 1958. It is a part of the citation, and therefore it is in square brackets. So round brackets are added pieces of information, square brackets are essential, to find the information, usually without a volume number. But it gets a little more complicated. <laughs> Examples 5, 6, and 7 have square bracket dates, but they also have volume numbers there. Uh, this is because the Supreme Court of Canada used to number its, there are, these are sites to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada used to use volume numbers on its report series but it changed over to using the calendar year. I think it was in 1923. And that was fine in 1923. They could fit all of their cases from one year for, uh, in one volume. But as of 1952, all of the cases from the Supreme Court of Canada won't fit in one volume. So they have to have a, 1958, a 1998 volume one, 1998 volume two, 1998 volume three. 
you leave off the square bracket date, you're not going to be able to find the case because there are um, 25 volume 1, 2, 3's from 1952 to date. So that's, a, that's an important element. Okay, um, I'm just trying to pick out some points that you might be interested here. In here, number four, guardian, guardian insurance. You notice that two dates are given, one's round brackets and one's square brackets. That's quite unusual, and that's because this case was handed down in 1940. That would be the date you'd find inside the volume, but it didn't get into the law reports until 1941. So in that case, you have to give both dates. Um, the first date identifies the date of the decision. The second date is where you find the volume. Um, the SCR in number four is an official site. So if this case had been reported, say, in DLRs or the family, uh, reports of family law, they would have followed the SCR site. Example eight gives you a case <coughs> where the decision has been reported in three different reporters. We've had to tell our readers that the case is from the Queen's Bench, because we can't tell that from the citations. We can tell that it's from Alberta, but not that it's from the Queen's Bench. And when you have more than one uh, reported citation, you would normally give it to the, you, to the reader because you don't know what law reports they have access to in their library or their office. So even if the case is reported in five different law report series, you should include those in your citation. Yes, question. Any um, protocol in the order? Yes. The official law reports first, which are the Supreme Court of Canada, the SCRs, and the FCs, the federal court. Then the semi-official, which would be things like the ORs published by the Law Society, uh, published, is published by a commercial publisher under the um, Law Society's mandate, and then the uh, commercial publications. This book, this little Bible here, tells you which reports are official and which aren't official. But there are no subject reports that are official. Are I can't think of any. Um, so if it's a subject report, like the reports of family law, business law reports, Canadian cases, and security law, they're not going to be official reports. But sometimes they'll be the only site you have. This book covers any situation you can think of, I'm afraid. Um, now example 10, here we've given the history of the case. And that's important. You should give the history of the case. Now, in this instance, we started out with the Ontario Court of Appeal, the 16 RFL, Reports of Family Law Second, is uh, an Ontario Court of Appeal level. So we note that it is reversing the county court. So the decision, the case went from the county court and was reversed by the Ontario Court of Appeal. And that's important to know. If we had done it the other way around, if we'd had the lower court first, we would have used the word reversed. So reversed and reversing, and there's a big difference. Make sure you have the right phrase there. Number 11 there. Um, it's, it's fun to go down citations and see what you can know about the case just from looking at the citation. We know that number 11 is a criminal case because it's R versus. Oh, and uh, we also know that it's Ontario, and we've been told that it's Court of Appeal. Number 12 is an unreported case. <clears throat> and there are indeed some unreported cases, and they're, they're rather hard to get a hold of. So you should put all the information you know about the case when you're citing an unreported case, including the docket number if you have it. If you can't get the case on QL and you can't get it from an unreported judgment um, service like the All Canada Weekly Digest, then you have to apply to the court. 
And the more information you have there, the more likely you are to, to find it. The last um, citation is from QL. It's an electronic source. And I see I've made a mistake there. There should not be periods between the Q and the L. Take those out. It should be just QL. And citing cases from online databases isn't all that different from citing um, printed law reports. You have the identifying um, year. You have OJ, which stands for Ontario Judgments, the number of the judgment. And then you've had to provide the uh, vendor that provides it, QL. And then you've had to provide the court level, because you're not told that in the citation. Hmm. So that's, um, that's about all I have to say about citations. Yes? Number two? Well, if you're using QL, you would uh, f uh, establish whether the Quebec Superior Court reports were on there. If they're not, you just try to find the case in its unreported form by typing in the style of cause, remilieu, and the, and the date or whatever information you want to put there. When the case comes up, under the style of cause, there's a link button. You just click on the link button to the, uh, to the um, QL citator, and it t gives you the history of the case. If it goes back this far, and I'm not sure whether QL does go back to 58 for noting up ca uh, Quebec cases, it may, it may not. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, you never have a style of cause with just one party. Re basically means about. It could be in a state matter. There, there isn't a plaintiff and a defendant. It's maybe about um, an estate. It could be in the estate of. You always have to have a re, an ex parte, or a v for versus. And when you say v, you don't say v versus. You say and. Um, you, you may notice that. They wouldn't say McGilvery versus Shaw if you're talking about it. You say McGilvery and Shaw. I don't know why, but that's, that's uh, what they do.